Um, my name is Norm Cox. I'm a Coldwell Banker, Town and Country. I've been with Town and Country now for 21 years. Lance has owned it for about 11. Um, I've been training with uh, the associations Ivar and Sivar for well, Ivar for 15 years. This is supposed to be one hour on the RPA, and I think you probably typically you would devote at least twice that. We'll try and get through the things that we do. The essence of real estate is getting a listing. The essence of money is getting an offer on the listing. And I always think of the RPA as the most significant uh, document that we have to work with, because unlike a listing which can be corrected before something goes wrong, an RPA, generally speaking, is accepted on its face before there's much management review or before there's any opportunity to say, oops, and we get a lot of oopses. Part of the difficulty that we have with the RPA is CAR's insistence on calling it a 10 part form. When in reality, if you can get through without at least three or four additions, um, you have you know, most, of the, most of them go, not counting the front end disclosures, most of them have three or four uh, addenda and we'll talk about those and just skip over them. My general process in this is just to start at the beginning and to beg for questions. I don't know if any of you have ever attended my live performances, but I think that it's very important to have interaction, uh, war stories, things of that sort. We try and confine it to an hour. And now if I can get my RPA up, Hi, Vicki. <laughs> okay, do we have, can, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Norm. We're good. All right. Upper left corner, set in stone. It doesn't matter the relationship to the time of signing or the time of acceptance. When you refer back with counter offers or addenda in the course of the escrow, this is the original number, that date. You can prepare it on Sunday afternoon at home, get it signed Monday, get it not accepted till Friday. But that is the date when they say dated, that's what they're talking about. The offer, offer should be from the people who are gonna buy it. The address should be very clear, very straightforward. One of the things that we have discovered is that we are not the best people in the world at keeping track of numbers. So the assessor's parcel number is quite critical. You get a house on a corner and it may be numbered by the post office one way and on the original plat map on the other, on the cross street and another. Very important. Close of escrow. There must be a close of escrow because without a close of escrow, of a finite date, there is no contract. Paragraph 2B is leg number two of the milking stool of agency. The first is the AD the advisory. In this case, you'd use the AD2. And if these are not completed, if these boxes are not checked and the licenses are not there, or we fail to sign on page 10, there's a long ago court ruling shortly after we did the buyers are entitled to be represented number in California that said all of these three must be disclosed and completed or buyer has the right to rescind the contract after close of escrow. I've not seen that happen other than in the court case, but it is case law and there it is. Um, I have filled these in as examples for the long, the 20 hour training class. So some of them are kind of nonsensical and some are redundant. The initial deposit, fortunately most of us now don't have to take the check run it through the book that says money not placed in the broker's trust account. We've put the burden on the buyer to provide the funding to the escrow directly. At first, most of us thought, oh my God, we're going to have people who sign an or offer and then never deposit the money. Hasn't worked out that way. It's really been pretty good. I think that we would all, all of us who've been around a while would say, this is a much better system than our having to keep track of checks. There are still provisions in here for you to keep track of checks if those are given to you. 
and you must post them in your broker's log of money not placed in the broker's trust account. These are trust funds and you may not do anything with them other than to keep track of them if they are handed to you. Increased deposit is not a very common thing, at least offered, it's very often asked for in a counter offer. Generally speaking, you'll find it's a professional who makes a token down payment and will increase the amount after a, a period of a certain number of days for due diligence. It's rare. If that amount is going to be part of liquidated damages, then that a form uh, RID has to be signed. We have an example of it. We'll dash through those. All cash offer, pretty clear. You check the box. Better have evidence of the, all, all the cash is there. None of this business of after three days. Here we get into something that's, again, the courts have had a lot to say about. A first loan or a second loan is not only an amount, it's a formula. The buyer is entitled to the protection of a, a, an upper rate beyond which the buyer need not take the loan. The seller is entitled to know he's not dealing with a nitwit. Uh, back, what was it, 18 months ago when we hit 5% interest, we kept getting offers of 30-year fixed, 3%, one point. Well, that's okay because you can counter it, but if it's zero, you don't know what's going on. The buyer may think I'm gonna get three and a half and the seller may think the market is at four. He might go four and a quarter. Nowadays with variable interest rates based on FICO scores and so on, this is a particularly critical part. And the courts have ruled that if it is not included, the buyer may rescind the contract after the close of escrow. That's never good for brokers or sellers. So be sure to include that. It's also good to put in points, although that's not critical. Uh, additional financial terms. Uh, loan is a VA no-no, buyer deposit to be returned at close of escrow. And as you can see, the algorithm in uh, ZIP makes it a, a refundable amount. Don't put here that the, the seller is to donate money at the end of escrow. The seller credit at close of escrow is not a part of the, of the financing conditions. And it is a, a separate contractual matter. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Purchase price total, if you do your numbers correctly, that should come out the way you want it to. Uh, initials, for my sins, one of my tasks is to review all of the contracts that pass through the office. Uh, probably one in 15 or so, they'll be missing initials all over the place. So do, do that and uh, be careful. If you have the increased deposit and you want it part of liquidated damages, this form must be signed. If you have an FHA loan, uh, this is the form that you will present to the seller if FHA appraiser wants any matters corrected. No, no correction to the appraiser's desire, no, no loan, obviously. This is increasingly being uh, enforced uh, because we are seeing more and more little precautions about insuring bad properties. Here's the amendatory clause, which has to go with it. The amount offered, I'm sorry, the amount accepted must be matched here or the, the FHA or VA borrower is entitled to their money back and be, to cancel the transaction. This is a required document if you represent buyer or seller. Here's page two. Verification of down payment. Nowadays, it almost invariably is attached. There with multiple offers, we have one going through the house where there are 20 offers and nobody knows what to do. They're all good. Um, you just have to attach the verification and the evidence of, of down payment because otherwise, who's going to bother to look? I remember the good old days when you'd go out, find a house, they'd make an offer, they'd get accepted, then they'd go talk to the bank to see if they could get a loan. 
loan applications three days or later are not cutting it. The time may come when anybody will be very happy to wait for as long as it takes to get a loan, but so far sellers are just taking whatever's available. Loan contingency, that's a very important part. The waiving of a loan contingency as a part of the offer or as an acceptance in a counter offer can be very dangerous. We have this business of 10 days, 15 days, 17 days, whatever it is uh, that we say that uh, we finally decide that the time can be. This is uh, the loan application in three days, the loan contingency, the contingency removal, in 21 days, mm, a problem. But when we have that, we do have a, a safeguard for the buyer. And remember, if you're doing this, unless you're a dual agent, you do have a, a, the ultimate fiduciary duty to the buyer. No loan contingency. If it's all cash, that's a good one to mark. Lender limits on buyer credits. This is fairly new. You're asked for a $6,000 credit or a 2% credit at close of escrow. And that's the thing that doesn't go on the bottom of page one because it's not a financing term. But the banks can say, hey, wait a minute. We think that this buyer is with this escrow in this book, with this FICO score should not be allowed that much cash back. Otherwise he has very little or no skin in the game. When the bank says that, that becomes the amount that the seller is allowed to, to contribute or that you're allowed to contribute. It's total contributions. And I think that this is a very important thing for you to remember. If you represent the buyer, be sure to get this contract over to the lender as quickly as possible and point out that there is a seller credit at the end and be sure that the bank approves of it. Buyer stated financing, the, buyer is the seller is relying on the buyer's representations. That's true throughout. Buyer relies on seller, seller relies on buyer. The representations are presumed to be true. It may turn out that the buyer doesn't qualify, but if he does not qualify because he has perjured himself in some way, it may leave him open to some loss of his, of his deposit. If the sale of the buyer's property is a contingency, you use the form COP. It's a very important thing to know that the buyer is practically ironclad protected. Unlike a seller who may find himself having to sell the house even if he can't find a replacement property, but that's a completely different story. If the sale, if the offer is contingent on the sale of the buyer's property, Use the COP, do it in detail. Paragraph five is where you have the opportunity to put advisories, uh, court confirmation case, it's a probate or something of that sort. Uh, septic, the farther east you go and the farther north you go, the more septic and well systems you're gonna find. It's probably a good idea to test the uh, listing agent on his knowledge of, or her knowledge of, of the particular uh, conditions of uh, septic and well. Buyer and seller advisories. Inspection advisory is already marked. I don't know why we do that, but there you are. I think the SBSA, even though you don't send it over along with the offer, is a very important thing to have included. That's 14 pages of what CIR thinks is wrong with California or wrong with the subdivisions or wrong with government. And if you're a seller, it's not terribly important. Our policy is if a seller can't or won't sign, or if it's a, a trust that's just uppity, we want our buyer to sign it because the buyer is going to be the one that's affected by the various policies. We also want the uh, WFA, MCA, and SIP to be a part of the uh, the part of the uh, contract. So we include it, even though we don't sell it, send it over. Paragraph six is where you put in everything. Buyers are aware property is a condominium with homeowners association rules and the seller is re uh, related to the listing agent. Well, you put all that in there and then you save yourself a lot of counter offers or addenda. And 
they don't have to hasten and in seven days tell you this is a condo. The seller shall not install nor pay for installation of water conservation fixtures, but will remain responsible for all other provisions of paragraph 7-2. Seller to credit buyer with $3,000 in closing costs. Let's discuss these. If you put all that business in about a condominium and being related, it saves a whole lot of, of garbage in a counter offer. If you're already aware of those things, include them. Counter offers, if they have to be made, void the offer. And if the counter offer is simply housekeeping along those lines, it's very important. Now, the next item is one that probably some of you will recognize the necessity for. Paragraph 7.2 says that the seller, most likely the seller, is responsible for any government required retrofit, any reports, any kind of inspections and repairing those inspections or making some provision. <clears throat> Not a big problem 20 years ago, now it is. There are more than 80 uh, cities, individual cities, and in some places the counties that require a point of sale inspection. And in Los Angeles, it starts at about $800 and goes on up because you have to install low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, sliding glass doors have to be tempered or covered with mylar. You don't want your buyer to have to pay for that. So if you put this in and it relieves the buyer of the responsibility for putting in the legally required but unenforced rules regarding water conservation fixtures and say that everything else they're responsible for, you've you don't have to make a buyer's counter offer that says, well, we want you to do the thing that the city requires. So those kinds of things are important. Uh, the seller to credit the buyer with uh, an amount of money. This is, again, not part of paragraph three, which is financing terms. This is part of the contract and it is also subject to the lender's uh, agreement if that says $8,000, the bank's limit is six, the whole thing is gonna to have to be amended to include it as six. Inspection reports, allocation of costs. Sellers shall pay for natural hazard disclosure. Always include the environmental, it's important. A termite report. Customary practice over the years has been that the seller pays, but Mark in here, buyer, to pay for a professional home inspection. Buyer's not required to, but if you put it in as a contractual requirement, they may be tempted to do it if they, if they were looking the other way. And of course, it's by buyer's choice. Government requirements and retrofit. Sellers should pay for smoke alarm and carbon monoxide device installation and water heater tracing, bracing, if required by law. Well, it is, obviously. Um, the issue of a carbon monoxide detector enforcement is one that's left up, as far as I can tell, entirely to the appraiser, uh, which is not a great plan. But we do have uh, uh, this provision, then we have the uh, WHSD, uh, which also helps, and, and then the uh, water conservation carbon monoxide detector. Here are the cities that require inspection or a report. And if you land, and there are more of them all the time. If you land in this city with a $700 city inspection requirement, you don't want your buyer to pay for it. That's the reason for that silly sentence about not paying for water conservation, but paying for the rest of it. So to pay for the cost of compliance with any other minimum mandatory government order or requirement. And the seller shall pay the cost of compl compliance with any of those and will provide the buyer with the information that the city requires it. Um, <clears throat> some of you will deal in places like Azusa where the city requires that there at minimum be a written report and the city may make an inspection. Um, I don't know of any cities in the Inland Empire where they require a city inspector to go, and there are very few in LA County, but Pasadena does require inspection by a city inspector. He's a city employee, 
and he says, city inspector, and he will come around and do a laundry list that you either have to get corrected or get the buyer to agree to correct after close of escrow. And the buyer has to go and put down uh, a bond and agree to do the work uh, within so many days. Buyer and seller shall pay escrow fees, put down each to pay own. There's very, very few places where there is not on occasion a favored client who gets a better escrow fee than uh, his opposite number. If you're buying your fifth uh, income property for a, a good customer, uh, the chances are pretty good you're going to haggle over his, his escrow fee, particularly if the escrow company or your escrow division has had his business before. If you put in each pay own, you fulfill the requirement that there be mutuality. If you put in 50-50 and one party gets a good deal and the other doesn't, that's not mutuality. And of course, somebody can raise Cain and you will look silly and have egg on your face. If you do not have an agreement beforehand, you can put in your favorite escrow company or seller's choice. Seller's choice lends mutuality. Any reliable does not. My idea of reliable and your ideal of reliable may be entirely different, particularly for things like termite. Now, if you say seller's choice and it's a bum choice, the burden lies with the seller. But if you put any reliable, you've got a problem. And that is particularly true with, with things like uh, the termite and other inspection requirements. Owner's title insurance, that means title insurance that protects the buyer. The buyer is required to make a, a, an insurance policy for his lender. And that's a different story. When they say uh, ho owner's title insurance, they mean that the seller will pay for insurance to cover the buyer's backside. Now, that is negotiable. And as a matter of fact, if you go to Northern California, customary practice is that the buyer pays for it. So, you know, if you go to Modoc County or Humboldt, don't expect them to do anything but laugh at you. Owner's title policy shall be issued by seller's choice. Again, that's mutual. We have agreed that the seller's in charge. Seller shall pay the county transfer tax or fee all counties in California have $1.10 per thousand. Some cities have it. We have about 60 cities in the Southland here that have some sort of tax. Pomona's about $2.60. I think Colton's about $1.30. LA's the beast in the room. They have $4.50 on top of the $1.10. So every thousand dollars transferred carries $5.60 of taxes. Homeowners Association, seller should pay. And here on eight, you might wonder why there's not an option. Our attorneys, <coughs> CAR attorneys decided that since it's required by statute that the seller provide that information, the seller should pay. The ones that are required by the contract that are not statutory, you have the choice of the seller or buyer paying. Now, the seller can always counter that out and say the buyer is to pay for all of it. Private transfer fees, they're not so common as they used to be, but they are here. Probably a good idea if you know there to be one to put that the seller shall pay it. Now, here's where you put the work. Sellers shall pay all section termite work and any section two required. The previous one just said they'd provide a report because it says reports. This says other costs. Uh, sellers should pay the cost not to exceed, and be sure you're careful because these costs are going up for a standard or an upgraded uh, one-year home warranty. Uh, you can choose that because your buyer is going to have to live with it. And be sure you put these things in, air conditioning, pool, whatever it happens to be. Uh, I do not think it is a good idea to waive uh, a home warranty at the outset. If the buyer seller comes back to the buyer and says, we're not buying it, then the buyer can say, okay, but if you waive it, and then the buyer later wants it, he has no option but to pay for it himself or herself. Note to buyer and seller, items listed as included or excluded in the MLS, flyers or marketing materials are not included in the purchase price 
or excluded from the sale unless specified in paragraph A, B, or C. Do remember that. When you take the listing, they say that they include the child swing set in the back and not the, uh, the crystal chandelier. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything in the MLS or in your flyer. If it isn't in the contract, one way or the other, it isn't part of the contract, then whatever is there is there. If it ain't writing in writing, it ain't in, uh, in uh, real estate. Existing fixtures and so on, it's pretty good, not much of a problem. Uh, and it, you know, it's a laundry list of things, we all know about them. We have included now this thing where you can say all stoves except, all refrigerators except, all washers and dryers. Click them if they say no, then they go along. The following additional items are included. Well, if you have to, make an over, overflow addendum and put in the things that you want to be included. But if they're not included in writing, they're excluded. If you have items that are excluded and you know it beforehand, here's a good opportunity to put it in so you don't have to get a counter offer. Items excluded from sale the Tiffany lamp in the dining room must be replaced with the appropriate unit. If the buyer says that to the seller, you have another line that doesn't have to go into a counter offer. It's important to understand that you're trying to minimize counter offers. You're trying to protect your buyer. You're trying to be fair because your duty requires it. But you need to have a clear view of what the outcome is going to be. And if you have a seven item counter offer that is just housekeeping that you could have forestalled, be by simply using a little detail in your offer, you're much ahead of the game. Here's another place for initials. This is an application for a home protection plan. I urge you, if you do not know that this is the case, to understand that you're obligated to tell the seller at the time of listing that he or she is can be partially covered by this for 84 or 62 or whatever it is cents a day during listing and during escrow, if the, if the property does not sell, there's no charge. And it's a kind of nice little thing to say, well, don't worry about it. I'll just um, pick up the 70 cents a day at close of escrow. If you're going to be more than 30 days, the seller's going to remain more than 30 days after close of escrow, you must use a residential lease after sale. It is a lease. The bank may not be happy with it. You better confer with the bank. They will probably allow 60 days, but they don't want more than that. This is a very large uh, thing. Uh, there's another form which we should talk about, which is the septic, I'm sorry, the uh, seller in possession. We'll get to that. Here is the inspection, well inspection property monument. Generally speaking, you're gonna to want to use inspection and report the location and access, pumping and certification. Excavation is seldom necessary. And if there is more than one septic system and the seller doesn't know it, um, maybe you better have them identify it. Most people are pretty good about it, but there's no way really to tell that there's a septic system if the septic system is good and the people haven't lived there for a long time. They may think they're connected to a sewer because the sewer is in the middle of the street what they don't know is that they have a particularly good septic system and it's never been done. Well, well inspection and allocation of costs, the seller should provide all of this. A government report, eh, have them choose somebody to go out there and check it for volume and for bacterial testing and general uh, potability. Chemical and radiological testing is probably important nowadays with as much industrial stuff as we have. So, Probably if you have a, a septic tank and a well, you want to fill in a lot of stuff on page one. Page two, property monuments and corners. I've never seen that done. It's certainly legal to ask for. Propane, check the all that apply. Again, going north and east from our general market area into the desert, into the forests, you are going to run into those things. Are they owned or leased? Those are very important. You can see what I mean when I say that our RPA is not a 10 page form. And we're halfway through here. The seller's license to remain in possession. 
This is a license. It used to be a, just a, a, what amounted to a short-term lease. And the court said, well, it is a short-term lease and the seller becomes a tenant at will if he chooses to remain there after the three days or five. You have to evict him through un, uh, unlawful detainer. This is a license. If you think about what you're allowed to do with your real estate license the day after it expires, you'll understand why they make it a license. The court now, and maybe even a police department or sheriff's office, will view a seller remaining over the time specified in the SIP as a squatter and may evict them without any notice whatsoever because their license is run out. You may still have to go to court, but it's much quicker. If you're buying a single family dwelling and the tenant is going to remain, this is what creates a residential income property offer. If you look at the uh, RIPA, the language in this is virtually identical. It tells you uh, what the seller has to provide and what the, uh, what the uh, seller must or must not do. Okay, the condominium information should be made available immediately. Uh, all of this stuff that's supposed to be provided, termite reports, condominium information, disclosure, so on, supposed to come from the seller seven days after the last acceptance and be returned by the buyer within five days. That's in many cases a polite fiction, particularly when it comes to homeowners associations. Their management companies are notoriously slow. One of the things that I see on paragraph Roman three or Roman four of the AVID, a correction of the TDS, is the agent saying, I'm not an inspector, you better get this place inspected by a professional because I don't know what I'm talking about. That's very dangerous language. Five separate places by the time the buyer gets a TDS in his hands. In five separate places, our lawyers, whom we pay handsomely, have said it much better and much more succinctly. And you will run into it, the prosecution's attorney or the plaintiff's attorney who will make mincemeat out of you if you put something, well, what are we trying to hide? Were you hoping the inspector would come up with something that your seller didn't want disclosed? Whether it's relevant or not, they can make considerable uh, misery for you. Buyer's inspection of the property. Even through the 80s, it was customary for the buyers to sit with their minds folded in their laps and wait for escrow to close and then reach for a lawyer. And after a while, the court said, uh-uh. The buyer has a duty to see to his own interests. Now, that doesn't mean that you are off the hook. You have to disclose what you know. If you know something that your seller doesn't know, you're obligated to disclose it. If you have something that the seller knows but doesn't want to disclose, you have an obligation to disclose it. But buyers and buyer's agents have an affirmative duty to protect the buyer's interests. There's a case just recently in which the listing agent made a disclosure which said, you better check with City Hall. The buyer didn't check with City Hall. It turned out he bought a huge chunk of property on which he could not build what the prior uh, permits had allowed. And he sued, his, uh, he sued the listing agent and he sued the, his own selling agent. And the court said the listing agent did just what he was supposed to. The selling agent had a further responsibility to make the buyer investigate the, city, the pros, prospect at City Hall and he didn't do it. That is the seller's, the selling agent, the buyer's agent's responsibility. So you press your buyer to look at everything. And don't pull the, the permits for them because if there's a mistake in the permits, it's not going to be the city that's at fault. It's going to be you. They want to see permits. You take them down to City Hall. Say, Emily, behind the counters, a chum, she'll give us copies of anything we want, and I'll even pay for the copies. Sellers shall make the property available for the buyer's investigation as specified above. Sellers will have water, gas, electricity, and all operating pilot lights on for buyer's investigations through the date of possession is made available to the buyer. Whoa, how many times has your inspector gone, no pilot lights on or the electricity's off? 
probably should point, point that out to the listing agent. Nowadays, in this current era where things are going so fast, not much of a problem. When the market's slow, people don't want to be paying residual gas bills. Sometimes they don't even pay the water bill. The buyer has to indemnify the seller for any damages. Title investing. There are 13 ways to vest property in California. They must be vested in some way. A single man is sold in or a single man, a married woman who sold in separate property, husband and wife is joint tenants. Don't give advice. That is a tax and legal matter. Vesting and title are have incredible consequences and you want to be very sure that you get them done. Time periods. I think we all run into problems with time. Uh, many times it's uh, very often, I should say, it's, it's not a question of our doing wrong or not knowing what we're doing or that somebody else screwed up. Sometimes things are simply impossible. Don't allow a date to pass that permits either party to rescind the contract. Always before the original RPA came out, which was in 20, the, uh, the year 2000, so it's now 20 years old. Before that, silence deemed approval. If, you, if, if escrow and the seller didn't complain that the deposit wasn't made, it was presumed the deposit was made. If the buyer didn't ask to have something repaired, it was presumed that the property was all right. This contract stands that rule a very old one from the common law on its head. It requires that you make each step identified. If you do not have your money in by three days to escrow, the contract is breached and the seller has the right to issue a notice to perform or cancel. And if you don't get it in by the fifth day, because you get two days notice, he has the right to cancel. And all of these things that have time limits on them should be extended. The ones that are most frequently extended are either some extra inspection, HVAC, the roof, something like that. Lead gives them a, a statutory 10 day extension. The loan is the most commonly extended condition. But don't say, oh, well, you know, it was due yesterday and we won't have it till tomorrow. Put in an extension of time addendum. And all of these time periods here mean what they say, unless you change them by mutual agreement. Buyer has the right to cancel in a number of places. When he gets the TDS, when he gets the NHD, he has the right to cancel with 70 in 72 hours in writing without any reasonable standard, without any mutually agreed thing with the seller. He simply has the right to cancel outright. That is the biggest get out of jail free in contracts that imaginable. The seller has no such right. If the buyer is in compliance with the contract, meeting things on time, providing data on time, the seller may not cancel. Only the buyer's breach of contract allows the seller to cancel. Notice to seller to perform, notice to buyer to perform. When the buyer removes all contingencies, it is presumed ipso facto, as the lawyers like to say, that he or she is going to buy. And if he refuses, after removing all contingencies, the seller may, in all likelihood, will be uh, eligible to collect the liquidated damages. The problem with that, of course, is that you get in hair pulling contests and you cancel a contract, but you can't get people to can cancel the escrow. That's two different issues. The close of escrow, you may cancel the agreement for failure of the other party to close escrow, but you must serve this form, the demand to close escrow. We have a whole category of things that like demand to close escrow or notice to perform or cancel that you can use for other things, but we're not going to go into those because we still have a few pages to go here. The effect of cancellation on deposits. Remember, the cancellation form, form CC, contract cancellation, is in two parts. Part one can be signed by one party, either the seller or the buyer. 
There may be subsequent legal consequences, but either party may cancel. And as soon as that is served on the opposite party, usually through the agent, then the contract on the property is canceled and is no longer enforceable except by court order. The part two, the disposition of the deposit is by mutual agreement. And very often you get people who simply will not agree to do that. It's rare, but when it happens, it gets to be kind of tough. Liquidated damages is a whole category of discussion. I have seen two liquidated damages paid 100% to the seller in the last 10 years. I have seen some negotiated settlements where the seller got a little bit and the buyer got a little bit. Most of the time, both the circumstances and the courts will favor the buyer. Final verification, commonly called the five-day walkthrough. That is for the purposes of seeing if the agreed repairs were made. It's for the purposes of being sure that nothing severe has happened to the property since it was viewed the last time. There is a, I don't know if we've come to it yet. There is, I think we may have. There's a line in here that says that the buyer has a right to access the property for 17 days after acceptance, even if all the conditions have been met. And if you go in there on your 17th day and everything's fine and you go in there on the 40th day of a 45 day escrow and somebody's taken a door off the hinges or stolen the air conditioning, there are uh, remedies, but you cannot ask for something new on the five day walkthrough. The remedy in the circumstances I just described would be a letter from the buyer to the escrow holder with a copy to the listing agent saying, do not close this escrow without further written instructions for me for the following reasons. And then you say, the HVAC has been stolen and somebody's taken a door off the hinges. And if everybody's advised of that, escrow cannot accept at its own peril, peril close the escrow because it is mutual. And if one of them pulls out the mutuality, then escrow can't proceed. Repairs, here's an interesting one, file and verification, et cetera performed in the seller's expense may be performed by the seller or through others, provided work complies with applicable laws, including government permits, et cetera, et cetera. Repairs shall be performed in a good, skillful workmanlike manner. But the seller shall obtain invoices and paid receipts for repairs performed by others, prepare a written statement indicating the repairs performed by the seller and the date of such repairs, and provide copies of invoices and paid receipts and statements for, to the buyer for final verification. I've been in the business now uh, 38 years, almost 39. I've never seen that. I've never seen somebody hand over a bunch of saying, this is what we repaired. It's interesting. Prorations of property taxes, that goes without saying, that's an escrow problem. If you have issues with prorating property tax, speak with your manager, it's pretty straightforward. Brokers, our compensation may never appear Broker compensation may never appear, never bring commission, do not bring commission in to an RPA or its addenda or its counter offers. That is strictly outside of the purview of buyer and seller. You may have a separate uh, agreement with a buyer to pay you a commission if you find a house. The listing agreement is a, an agreement to pay, among other things, commission if the house sells. But the actual issue of commission is all on separate documents between brokers or their representatives in the form of agents and the principals. The scope of duty. Our scope of duty is open-ended. You must do as much as you can do. Uh, Churchill said, it's no good saying I'm doing the best I can. You must do as much as the circumstances required. Your fiduciary responsibility is open-ended. You are, according to the court about five or six years ago, counselors and advisors, you must give the best advice and counsel that you can. And that covers everything. If you don't know the answer to something, don't guess. Use the old sales gimmick. People have used it for decades. I don't know, I'll find out and I'll get back to you does three things. I don't know, says, I don't make up stories. I, I, I have some limits on my education, but I'll find out. And you will find out. 
and I'll get back to you as an opportunity to ask for a phone number or an email address. So you serve a number of purposes. Don't fake it. Right now, people walking through our front doors are picking up the phone and calling us, know an awful lot about our industry. Some of them know more than even the most experienced agents. Don't fake it. Representative capacity for at least 600 years, it's been acceptable to put a comma after somebody's name and say, president, trustee, uh, executor, uh, whatever it happened to be. And about six years ago, uh, CR decided we needed a form that said, when I said I was comma executive or comma trustee, I meant I was comma executive or comma trustee. I'm signing saying that that's what I meant. And we had one form for everybody. Then they decided they needed one for sellers and landlords and another for buyers and tenants. And then they decided they need one for each. So what we did not need one of seven years ago, we got one of, then two of, we now have four. Use them because Sierra will defend you if there's anything wrong with it. Joint escrow instructions. Here's something that all of us just rejoiced. And those of you in the sound of my hearing have been around a while will remember how happy we were that the actual contract was going to serve as part of the escrow instruction. Well, that lasted about 20 minutes. Why? Because we rely, we write lousy contracts. All of these paragraphs that you see here, 1A, 6, 7, all of them have to be complete, have to be accurate. If you could read them, they were not, you were lucky, but half the time they were, were empty. For example, the 3D1, the interest, if it isn't in there, it's no good as an escrow instruction. So now escrow holders will politely uh, attach this to an escrow, but they go back to what they used to do, which is to write all the stuff that's cogent, everything in those paragraphs into an escrow instruction. Remember that you cannot modify a contract with an escrow instruction. An escrow instruction is mutually agreed by two people to execute what is a contract or its amendments. If you have to amend something, changing price, extending date using the ETA, um, changing a, uh, the amount of credit that the seller is gonna give, you must do that on an addendum form of some sort. A request for repairs signed is an addendum. It becomes part of the contract. You must do those things before you can ask escrow to do anything. So the escrow instructions are by mutual agreement passed through the real estate brokers. Uh, do try and remember to give the uh, agreement to the escrow holder. We have had cases where nobody passed it and then 10 days later, somebody came looking for their escrow instructions, discovered nobody had done it. Liquidated damages, a whole tale. What it amounts to is this. All of the efforts that were made to decide what qualified a seller to receive liquidated damages have pretty much been thrown out. The only thing that's required now to get liquidated damages is mutual agreement after the escrow is canceled or after the contract's canceled. The seller is protecting him or herself by initialing and the buyer is assuring himself of some standing if they initial this because you cannot collect as liquidated damages more than 3% of the purchase price or the deposit, whichever is less. And historically, we have done less than 3%. But if these are not initialed, then the seller can get whatever the court will award him, which may be nothing. And the buyer is left with his uh, deposit in limbo. And there's just, there's nothing better than, than liquidated damages because it's protection on both sides. Dispute resolution. Um, we all thought that arbitration was gonna be great because it was cheap, it was quick. We didn't have to sit and give depositions in lawyers' offices. We didn't have to go to court. It's turned out to be a mixed blessing. Many of the people who do mediation and arbitration, well, mediation, not so much, but arbitration are, are really not competent. They don't understand real estate law. And uh, the problem here is that the buyer is giving up a number of rights. The seller is pretty well protected. The listing agent is sort of protected. 
the seller's agent is somewhat protected. The, the seller is protected about as much as you can. There's no, uh, no appeal, no going to trial after the arbitration, and they're just stuck with it. Now, where you come in on this is that you can't advise a buyer or a seller to initial this. Agreeing to it is a legal matter, and they're entitled to legal counsel. What you can say, and what many people do say, is that the average seller will not accept something where it's open-ended and there can be court. They want the buyer to initial this, and they will initial it. Further, a bank may not lend money to a buyer where there is no agreement for arbitration between buyer and seller. Not the best solution in the world, but there you are. You just can't tell them, yes, sign here. Uh, we're allowed to attend arbitration. We're allowed to attend mediation. Selection of services. This is where you give them the list of three or four good suppliers, people known to you to be good, because you're by court decree, you're not allowed to let them use bad ones. The only way to keep them from using bad ones is to give them good ones. And if they choose a bad one, you've done your best. Keep track of what you give to them, by the way. Multiple listing service. The buyer's entitled to know that the house is going to be, uh, the house has been in the multiple listing service with lots of pictures. Um, they're entitled to know that the uh, price will be put into the multiple listing service. Attorney's fees. I'm sorry, we're out of it. We can't collect attorney's fees under these terms. The assignment. I see more and more assignments. Joe Jones comes and buys a property. He has puts Joe Jones or assignee, not an assignee or assignee. And then somebody comes along, usually an LLC or a small corporation or a partnership, and they take a long-term uh, interest in it. And what they're doing is putting the thing uh, into a, the hands of an entity. Now the assignment must be given to the entity or someone responsible for it. And that person must go back and sign all prior documents and all subsequent documents, including the, uh, including the uh, escort instructions. Equal opportunity, I think you know, we don't have to worry about it. You know, look around the average office, we look like the United Nations. Uh, it's still there and we've got a long way to go, but it's not nearly as blatant as it once was. And don't ever be a party to it. Terms and conditions, written, absolutely. If you're going to modify it, you modify it in writing. Time is of the essence, yeah. Don't let it, ex don't let it fall out of, of contract. Don't let a time period go by unfulfilled, with a condition unfulfilled, without using an, uh, uh, an extension of time addendum. If you are having a hard time sleeping, take one of these. Just start reading through the definitions and you'll fall asleep quickly. Expiration of offer. Here is one where we have an interesting breach of knowledge. If there is no name filled in there in paragraph 31, preferably the brokerage, but your name if it must, if you want, put one or the other. If that line is not completed, the only legitimate way to serve this offer on the buyer is to the buyer directly. That's what that sentence says. And if it is not served on the buyer because they're in, they're skiing it or escaping the fire at Malib at, uh, Mo <laughs> well, anyway, uh, then there's no delivery. And the, the rules here are, of course, offer acceptance delivery. With no delivery, there is no contract. Put your brokerage name or your name, and if you're going to put both, put broker or your name. That will make the, the delivery when you pass it over to them. The buyer signs, the acceptance, if there's going to be a counteroffer, mark it here. If there's going to be uh, somebody signing as a representative capacity, or if there are additional sellers, if there are four people, you mark that on the back. The final rule and the third uh, leg of the milking stool of agency is your signature on here. 
anybody in that represents the brokerage, any licensee may sign it. It's customary practice for the listing and selling agents to sign. Without the signature, there is not a complete agency disclosure and the statute says, and the courts have said, that the, pro the project can be uh, set aside afterwards. And with two minutes to spare, we've made it through the RPA. Awesome, Norm. <laughs> oh, Ron, wow. Thank you for that. Um, well, we do have a few questions. Uh, one of them was on item 1D. Uh, is it better to put an actual date for close of escrow versus days? Uh, I think that's a good question. Now, Lance and I have a doctrinal difference about that. I think it's better to put days after acceptance. And the reason I think that is because, let's make up a story that you make the offer on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Well, you can't possibly expect acceptance until the following Tuesday. And so you've lost all those days. And if you have a date certain that's 30 days out, you're gonna to have to amend that. If you have a date certain, then you can be sure to choose that it's not a holiday. So it's, I, I favor the number of days. Most of it is polite fiction anyway. A 30 day escrow is, always has been a rarity, but it still is. Um, a date specific is something to shoot for. Um, I know we don't like to say we shoot for things. We want to be certain that we're going to do it right. But at the end of the day, either way is good. There just has to be something there. Uh, I, 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 you and I probably, are, the only reason I like date specific is my legal background and CAR legal has said that, you know, a date specific is better, but one, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato. Either way, um, just make sure you're, we're all watching those dates too, you know, after acceptance. What is after acceptance, Norm? Okay. Acceptance occurs on day zero, and the ca first calendar day after that is day one, and it counts weekends, holidays, catastrophes. Uh, there are no holidays in, in real estate as far as the contracts are concerned. The day on which the contract is, is signed, the final con uh, counteroffer, is day zero. Correct. Great. Great. Uh, another one, um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but uh, and Carolina, I'll, we'll be talking later this week. But uh, is it okay to leave blanks without having to put n, n slash a, which means not applicable? Well, it depends. Not on paragraph 31, uh, not on paragraph 3D1. You want to put in something, and if it is truly something you can leave blank, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Yeah, a blank means a blank. I like to draw a line. NA is perfectly good. It means you didn't overlook it. It also forces you to look at it. And the contract has already very, uh, uh, several default uh, days or timelines in there anyway. So leaving it blank, there's already a default in the contract in most. Oh well, yeah, but there are some things that, that that just don't don't require it. Right. Exactly. But, yeah. um, okay. Um, I don't. To, did you, I'm sorry, Norm, did you have something else you wanted to follow up with? The best defense of yourself, not just in court or arbitration, but in, in, the, in, the, in the court of public opinion, is a, a thorough, well-written contract. This is, the, this is where we and the public really come into contact and where we're, we're not advocates so much as we are uh, facilitators, but we are also counselors. And if we do this job right, We'll have fewer and fewer problems as we go along. Correct. Absolutely. Um, anyone else have any questions? That was a lot to digest, I know. Uh, and is it, it is important that all of you, no matter how long you've been in the business, really read the contract. You need to know what it says and be able to explain that to your client. Especially in this day and age where we're doing digital signing all the time, you know, there's more and more court cases saying, the agent didn't go over the contract with me. They just sent it digitally. I didn't know what I was signing. So I don't know what your practice is, Norm, but I'll tell you what my practice is. I actually send the contract uh, via email first. Yes. I tell them to review it and to call me with questions. I want to go over it with them. If they choose not to call and ask for questions, I have it documented that I reached out and <laughs> wanted to have that dialogue. 
uh, and if they sign it, they're not going to be able to go to court and say that I didn't, uh, I did not explain the contract to them. So risk management, make sure they get it in advance and then, and then I'll offer to go over it. I, I'm pretty insistent that I go over it with them. Um, uh, if they say they're fine, at least they've been put on notice. Yeah. I think that, that a disciplined agent will call and say, let's go through this. When you get some of those disclosures back from the seller, some of those things really need illuminating. Uh, some things need interpreting. Some things have to be saying, well, that doesn't look right. And, and we're supposed to be able to do that. I don't have a strong feeling that everybody is doing what you do, but we certainly try. We try and, and do it. One of the blessings of, of COVID has been that we do do a lot of email tracing. And we have a lot of documentation that we don't ordinarily have because not everybody makes good notes in their file. I remember texting when you're going over terms of a contract or anything that's substantive to the transaction, you're going to need to screenshot their apps and what have you, because you need to document that and put that in your file as well. Those Absolutely. Texts, those texts we, are as important as emails. Yeah, we were lucky that, or not lucky, that CAR, I'm sorry, that the legislature didn't demand that we keep texts in file. A good agent will, will forward text to his email, print the email, put it in file. We use a, a contract management system called SkySlope, and we put emails in there all the time that say things like that. Absolutely. Any other questions? All righty. Well, Norm, I really appreciate you taking this hour out of your day. And just I'm delighted to do it. I, I love teaching anyway. But yeah. we, both Sivar and Ivar uh, do have this 20, 20 hours uh, that we're doing. We're doing it now on, uh, on Zoom, obviously. But right. I do it twice a year for each of the associations. And you're welcome to join. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, Thank well, you. Listen, have everyone have a great day. And uh, we'll see you um, whenever our, your next office meeting is or our next training or our Fire Up Friday, whatever it is that you'll be at next. Great. Take care. Thanks again, Norm. Thank you. Bye-bye.